Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our Gospel lesson, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ, I'd like to begin with a one-question quiz this morning. Don't worry, you're not going to be graded on it. But I would like you to raise your hand if you recognize the name Horatio G. Spafford. Anyone? Okay. Horatio Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman who virtually lost everything he owned in the great Chicago fire of 1871. That was all on the tip of your tongue, right? Well, two years later, Horatio decided that he and his family needed a break from all of the struggles of life, and so he planned a family vacation to England. Wrapping up a few loose ends in Chicago, he sent his family on ahead of him to begin their vacation. It was then that another tragedy struck the Spafford family. The ship carrying his four daughters and his wife sank, and only his wife survived. And she was all alone on the other side of the world. Yet in the midst of this grief, Horatio Spafford penned one of the church's favorite hymns. We know it in our hymnal as hymn number 763, When Peace Like a River. You know the one, it is well with my soul. I'd like another quiz. How many of you know Joseph Scriven? Anyone know Joseph Scriven? Scriven was a brilliant young man who was engaged to a beautiful young lady. However, the night before their wedding, she was tragically pulled from a pond where she had drowned. Yet in the midst of this tragedy, and in the midst of his heavy grief, Scriven wrote the well-known hymn we have come to number as 770 in our hymn note. What a friend we have in Jesus. Both of these beloved hymns brought comfort and hope to hundreds of thousands of people throughout history even to this very day. Yet both of them were a response of faith in the midst of a tremendous amount of grief. This morning, we will hear how tragedies can serve a good purpose as they remind all of us of the importance of repentance and faith. The people in Jerusalem were listening to Jesus talk about the last days and getting ready to face the final judgment before the the throne of God. Someone in that crowd wanted Jesus to give his take on a terrible tragedy that happened to some Galileans when they came to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, our text says. Now, whatever it was that the Galileans did to anger the Romans, we do not know. All we know is that Pilate responded in a very brutal way. And it wasn't enough that he had these Galileans killed in the temple of the Lord. But then he he allowed their blood to be mixed and mingled with that of the sacrifices. Now Jesus answers this inquiry in a very interesting and typical way. He answers it by raising another question. He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? You see, we as humans tend to see certain sins as being worse than other sins. For example, 
We might think that stealing something from Walmart is worse than going 79 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour zone. Even our laws are kind of set up this way. Take, for example, manslaughter versus uh, homicide. Homicide is punished more severely than manslaughter, even though in both instances, the result is the same. Someone loses their life. So we often think of term, we think of sin in terms of levels, that there are some sins that are worse than other sins. Jesus addresses this issue. And he says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? According to human reason, we might conclude, yes, they must have done something terrible to receive such a disgraceful demise. Let the punishment fit the crime, we say. But is this the way the Bible categorizes sin? Well, for the answer, we turn our attention to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, where we read, for the wages of sin is death. Yeah, the wages of sin is death. Notice the Bible doesn't say for the wages of, of big, enormous sins is death. For the wages of sin is death. Any sin. Whether we see him as a big sin or a very small sin, the wages of sin is death. And that's because God's standard for justice is perfection. God's standard for justice is perfection. He demands perfection from you and from me. Indeed, he demands perfection from everybody outside these walls, from all people. Unfortunately, project, per, perfection is not something we can deliver. How do I know that? Again, we turn to the book of Romans, chapter 3, where we read, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every last one of us, myself included. Tragedies will come, the Bible states, because all have sinned. Because we live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is filled with sin into which you and I have contributed some portion. Simply put, we are living in a world that is dying. Were those Galileans worse sinners because they died in such a manner? Or what about the 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Were they more guilty than anyone else? The answer Jesus provides is no. Because of our sin, no matter how big, no matter how small, we all deserve to die. Because of our rebelliousness against God and his law, we all deserve eternal punishment. And that's the problem. You see, even though we deserve these things because of our sin, God does not desire that we suffer them. Instead, God wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, the Bible says. And that's what Jesus tells us in our text. He tells us that tragedies can be used by our loving God to lead people to repentance and faith. In verse 3, and again in verse 5, Jesus says, I tell you, but unless you repent... You will all likewise perish. Now, I know I've, I've said this before, but that Greek word for repent in our text 
means to change your mind. It means to go 180 degrees. Notice I didn't say 360 degrees, right? Let me demonstrate if I'm going this way and I turn 360 degrees, what happens? Going in the same direction, right? 180 degrees means to go in the opposite direction. That's what repentance in the Bible means. It means to go 180 degrees the other way. It means to change your mind. You woke up this morning and decided to have toast for breakfast, but then you changed your mind and you said, I'll have a donut at church instead. You decided, it, uh, as for, you decided on a career in the public sector, but then you changed your mind and began to look for jobs in the private sector. When you were brought to faith by the Holy Spirit, you were taken from a belief system that said, I can do it myself. I am not such a bad person after all. I can save myself if I try hard enough. But then the Holy Spirit caused a change in you and you realized you can't save yourself. And you trusted in Jesus to rescue you. You see, sometimes the Lord allows tragedies to come into our lives to wake us up, to cause us to repent, to cause us to change our direction. These tragedies are not meant to punish us because of some specific wrong that we've committed. How do I know that? Because God has already dealt the punishment that I deserve as a result of my sins. Because God has already dealt out the punishment you deserve as a result of your sins. Because God has already dealt out the punishment the world deserves because of its sins. He did it on the cross. Where Jesus took upon himself all of your sins and my sins, indeed the sins of the whole world. Jesus took upon himself the times when we drove too fast on the highway. He took upon himself those times when we took something that wasn't ours. He took upon himself the times when life was taken by the hands of another. And yes, he even took upon those himself the times when we failed to repent of all of our wrongdoing. Jesus took it all upon himself, upon the cross. All those times when we failed to live up to God's perfect standard, he took them to his cross. And he dealt with them there, taking on our punishment that we deserved. And all of our sins, every last sin we have committed, every sin we are committing, every sin we will commit, died with him upon his cross. In our text, Jesus tells of a man who planted a fig tree. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, Jesus says, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Now I'm told that fig trees are relatively low maintenance, yet they produce an abundance of fruit. However, the fig tree that Jesus describes was different. For three years the man looked for fruit on the tree, yet it bore nothing. The person was tending the fig tree, pleaded for more time. Sir, the man said, let it alone this year also until I dig it, dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord in our text calls us to repentance but he also has a warning for us. His warning is the time is limited. One more year, 
one more day, one more hour. That is what the Lord is giving us to repent and to change our ways. That is what the Lord is giving us to reach out to people with the gospel message, to bring them to repentance and to lead them to put their trust in the Savior Jesus Christ. Don't take this time of grace for granted. St. Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. God is patient with you and not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Lord may even allow a Christian, may even allow you or me to suffer in this world rather than take us home to glory so that through our suffering, we might bring glory to God and to bring others to faith in Jesus. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, St. Peter writes, but praise God that you bear that name. As I conclude this message, I'd like you to do something for me. I'd like you to take your finger and put it on your wrist or put it on your neck. Do you feel your pulse? I hope you feel your pulse. Do you feel your pulse? How many times does your heart beat each minute? 60, 70, 80, 500,000 times in a year. Yet our gracious Lord knows every last beat, even in the midst of tragedy. And he knows exactly when your heart will have its last beat. All of life, it doesn't matter who it is, all of life is precious to him. Therefore, now is the time to repent of our sins. Now is the time to believe in our Savior Jesus. Now is the time to be used by the Lord to lead others to the Savior. Don't take his time of grace for granted. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.